coming up on Foundation for Life with Dr. Waylon Bailey. Steadfast love, that is a word in the Bible. It is used over and over again to describe God. He sticks with us because of His faithful love, His loving kindness, His compassion, His, His steadfast love. For a long time in my life, I was, uh, I, I didn't really read, study the Psalms, uh, but I found that I was missing a whole lot uh, because the Psalms deal with life and the Psalms deal with the, the important subjects of life. One of the things that the Psalms does is it teaches us about God. Who is God? What is he like? And Psalm 103 is one of those that, that is at the very heart of telling us about God. So I want to read from Psalm 103. Uh, I have about a handful of psalms that I just think of as my favorites. And Psalm 103 is one of those psalms. And, and I basically, not all of it, but I've basically memorized it because sometimes on my runs when I'm trying to get my mind off of how awful it is to be running, I try to memorize and quote and pray back to God this psalm. I find it very meaningful. Psalm 103, praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as, the high, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his own children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, his righteousness with his children's children with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. This psalm sounds so happy, so joyous, so light and bubbly and peaceful. But it is that way because the author is remembering the goodness of God in terrible times. This psalm is written in response to life crashing in. Life is always filled with, you, you get everything planned. You, you get everything worked out. This is the way it's going to be. 
You know, I've got these plans in life. This is the way my life's going to be. I remember when Martha and I were in our young 20s, just married. We, we had all of these plans. We thought everything's going to happen this way. Uh, fortunately, we found God has better plans. But life never quite turns out the way you expect. Yesterday, we had a, we had a wedding. I officiated the wedding. It was in Central Hall. It was in that place that I no longer call, hope you won't either, our old worship center. But we were in Central Hall, and on Friday, we rehearsed the wedding, and everything went beautifully, worked beautifully. Wonderful young couple with great hopes and dreams about the future and want God in on their marriage and in on their life. I, I spent three or four hours with them in premarital counseling over a period of weeks. And you get to know couples like that. And they get to know you. And you know what their dreams are. And so we plan the wedding. Or they plan the wedding. And I gave them some direction. And, they, and we went through it. And everything worked fine for seven hours eighths of the wedding we got right to the end they had exchanged vows the the father had given her away we exchanged vows they repeated them it went off flawlessly they exchanged rings it went off flawlessly then it came time for the unity candle now, you don't have to have that in a wedding but a lot of people do and there is nothing but a little bit of symbolism and here's the way I always set it up. Uh, they have chosen to light the unity candle to, as a reminder, as a symbol of their marriage, their wedding, their union, as the Bible says, of their becoming one flesh. And then I always add something else to it, too. And as a symbol to remind us that Jesus is the light of the world. So I moved out of the way, and the candle was right behind me. The only thing that could have happened worse if I'd backed into the lighted candle, that'd have been the worst thing. But that didn't happen. So we go there, and they each take the candlestick, and they each start putting that can, those candles on the other one. And uh, nothing happened. <laughs> and they tried it again, and nothing happened. Now, the congregation, they can't see. The bride and groom are, you know, they're in front of all this, and so they can't see what's taking place. Uh, but I think they tried it the third time. And finally, it lit. Here's the problem. That the wick was maybe, 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 maybe a millimeter long. I really think if I were a candle company, if I owned a candle company, the one thing I would make sure is that candle's going to light. If you're going to make unity candles, that candle better light. <laughs> so after about the third time, and it's not working, and after I'd set it up, this is the symbol of their marriage, that it's lifelong. <laughs> and it is the symbol that Jesus is the light of the world. I reached into my pocket because from a little boy, I remember when my dad gave me my first pocket knife. It was about this long, really little thing. He carried a pocket knife. And from about three or four I've carried a pocket knife. Now, he taught me what to do with it and what not to do with it, but I carried a pocket knife. And I reached into my pocket, and I didn't have it. <laughs> so then we asked the groomsmen if they have a knife. I mean, just think about this. You're right in the middle of a wedding. And uh, by the way, guys, any of you got a knife? <laughs> well, fortunately, one of them did, and the groom then I mean, it's taking as long as it is for me to tell you the story. I mean, so he's standing up there and he's digging out. Fortunately, he's a guy who kind of knew what to do. So he starts pulling wax out. We tried, they try to light it again. Nothing happened. He, he whittled some more and finally it, it lit. And it stayed lit. 
And I made sure I stood in front of it in case it didn't stay lit. <laughs> Life does not always work the way you think it will. You expect it to. Martha and I were watching football Thursday night, the Packers and the Seahawks. And they interviewed Tyler Lockett, who two years ago had one of those horrific leg injuries that you see in the NFL. And they thought he would never play again. I mean, it's scary, some of the things that can happen to legs. And so, so they were afraid he would never play again, and he didn't for two years. But this year he is playing, and he's having a breakout season. He's having his best season ever. So they ask him, what makes this such a good season? And his response was, I learned that good things and bad things both happen on a football field. And you've got to accept the good and the bad. And then I thought about how often we want the good, but we don't accept the bad. We think that life has got to always be good. This psalm is about when life is not good, but it's about the God who loves us and cares for us even when we find the difficulty of life. Think about today. How many people blame God? There was a shooting. Where was God? Where, there are fires in California. Where is God? There are families that are hurting. Where is God? And this psalm tells us about God. Three very important things. The first thing it tells us about God is this. God cares for us. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and don't forget his benefits. It's an interesting thing when we use the word forget. If I ever tell anybody, write it down so that I don't forget to do whatever I'm supposed to do, I almost always find that I never forget to do those things. It's what I assume that I will never forget that I really do forget. When, when the psalm says don't forget God's benefits, it's really almost impossible to forget God. And his benefits, we know about God. It's impossible to forget that God created the earth, that he put everything into existence, that we are the work of his hands. It is almost impossible to forget those things. But this word really means to ignore God. Now, it's not hard to ignore God. It's very easy to ignore God. How many times have you left church on Sunday and put your Bible in the back seat and found it in the same place on the next Sunday morning? How many times have you, you gone through life and as Jesus said, the cares of the world and the desires for money and the, and the problems that we experience in life just kind of overwhelm us and we try to do everything on our own and we ignore God. It's the easiest thing in the world to do, to forget God, to ignore God. Some people think that this is written in this way because many rabbis, in, in addition to having a prayer before they ate, also had a prayer after they ate. And think about the way we do that. Thank you, God, for this food, it, but maybe it really makes a lot more sense to pray after you've been fed because we recognize the blessings of God. How many times have you ignored God where you prayed for something to happen and you begged God that it would happen? But you didn't put nearly as much time into thanking God as you put it into begging God. What this passage of Scripture tells us is that God cares for us. 
cares for us deeply, cares from the cradle to the grave. By the way, there's six things in verses 3 through 5 that describes of what God does. Look at them in your scripture. In, in verse 3, he read, he forgives all your sins. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with love and compassion. He satisfies you with the desires of your heart. I love Psalm 37 also. Uh, Trust in the Lord. Commit your way unto him and he will give you the desires of your heart. Verse 5 says, he satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. God is concerned with us for all of life. Even it is from cradle to the grave and even before the cradle. Amazingly, the Old Testament talks about, about the person in the womb. Jeremiah the prophet said that God had set him apart from the womb to be a prophet of the Lord, that God had already always had a plan for his life. Psalm 139 that I may preach from next week says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made that God... Look at the symbolism here. God has knit us together in our mother's womb. Today it is so common for a woman who's going to have a baby to have an ultrasound, usually at about 13 weeks. I remember so well when our older grandson, when he was just conceived, 13 weeks old, there was an ultrasound. Now, I'm not experienced enough or imaginative enough to be able to pick out a baby in a little ultrasound picture. I'm so glad that somebody can say, here, is, here, he, here he is, and here are all of his parts, arms and legs and nose, and everything is there. I never forget what was said because the technician said to my daughter, your baby is this size. He's the size, this is the way, I suppose it was a she, this is the way the technician described it. He is the size of a tube of lipstick. And everything he needs for life is there. Everything. She didn't say he is full grown. That would have been wrong. She didn't say that he, he's fully developed. That would be wrong. She says he's formed. Do you know that's the word the Bible uses? Isn't it amazing how far, how close science has finally come in catching up to God? Isn't it amazing how close modern psychology has come to catching up with God, to understanding human beings? Verse 14 says that God formed us, that we are formed of him. He is a God who cares from cradle to grave and before cradle to the grave. God is the one who cares for us for all of life. And if I could say anything to to young children, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders here, if I could say anything to teenagers here, if I could say anything to very young adults, it would be God cares for you and he cares for every part of your life that you will never get too old for God and you've never been too young for God. God cares cares for you. The second thing this passage of scripture says is that he wants the best for you and me and us. That God cares and that God has a plan and God has a design and God is working in your life and he wants the best from you. In verses 6 through 14, he just talks about all of the things that God has done. And we get our understanding, we get a lot of theology Theology is two words, God and knowledge, or God and word. And we get our understanding, our knowledge of God from this passage of Scripture. 
What, who is God? He's the one who forms us. He, he cares for us. You, you look through these verses and here are the things that you get about God. He is good and kind. He works wor- righteousness and justice. Look at verse eight. He is compassionate. That's the word for merciful. He doesn't give us what our deeds deserve. He is merciful. And he is loving and kind because he gives us more than we could ever deserve based on any good that we might have done. He is compassionate and gracious. And he is slow to anger. The picture of that is the people of Israel. You read through the Old Testament and one of the questions you ask is, why did God put up with those people? If there were a history of us in theological terms, people would read about it and ask, why did God put up with them? Why does he do that? Because he's compassionate and gracious, and he is slow to anger, and he is overflowing in steadfast love. That is a word in the Bible. It is used over and over again to describe God. He sticks with us because of his faithful love, his loving kindness, his compassion, his his steadfast love. He's dependable. And he's unchanging. He's forgiving. And he's a loving Father, did did you hear the way I read the verse 13 a minute ago? As a father has compassion on his own children. I had it on in there. Because that's the way we are, isn't it? We it's our children that we have compassion for, that we pray for, that we think about, that we want to do well. As a father has compassion on his own children, so our heavenly father loves us in that same way. He wants the best for us. What father is there who doesn't want the best for his children? What fa- I, I told somebody, I forgot who, I've said it many times, but almost always when somebody tells me good things that are happening for their children, I say it this way because this is the way I feel it. There, there are very few things in this world that are as wonderful as seeing your children do well. Well, guess what? God is a loving, heavenly Father who wants you to do well. He wants the best for you. Here's what I've learned in life. I've lived long enough now to look back and look over it and to see this and to see it not only based on the Word of God, but see it in experience. Life is best for me the more I am in obedience to God. God doesn't take anything away from you. He gives things to you. God doesn't bring any harm. He brings good. God wants you to obey Him. Life is best when you are obedient to God in every way. There's a third thing that is found here, and that is that I can count on God. I can count on God because he is eternal. I can count on God because he's unchanging. I can count on God because he is the same yesterday and today and forever. Many of you work in places where there are people who come in and you know either the boss or an employee or a fellow worker and you may say it this way, I wonder which, let's call him Bill, I wonder which Bill we're going to get today. Going to get the good Bill or the happy Bill? Let's call him Waylon. We're going to get the the good Waylon or the bad Waylon, the happy Waylon or the unhappy Waylon, the, the griping Waylon or the... You, you, how many times do we do that? But God's not that way. He's dependable. I can count on God, that he is good and kind. He cares for me and my future. My, his favor is never-ending. 
as far as the east is from the west. Think about that. In their minds, based on what they believed in the days of Christopher Columbus, east was a finite setting and west was a finite setting. And, you, and as far as the east is from the west, so great does God remove our transgressions from us. But we, of course, know there's never an east and never a west. You can head toward it, but you can never get to, to it. And God removes those transgressions from us that we can depend on God. His favor is unending. I can count on him. And this God who created me and who is with me cares about me deeply and wants me to know him and wants me to live with him forever. And we know something the psalmist didn't know. The psalmist looked for this day, but he never saw it. The psalmist longed for this day, but he didn't see it taking place. But we have seen it. We know what God looks like. He looks like Jesus. Perfect moral purity. Complete love. Unconditional Forgiveness. We have seen him in Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And God sent him to you and me that we might have forgiveness and hope and fullness of life that can come in only one way, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And right now, here's what we know about God. God is speaking to us through his Holy Spirit. Speaking to us as a group, but speaking particularly to us as individuals. Showing us things in life that need to be changed. Showing us things that are getting in the way of our relationship with God. Showing us that, that God is drawing us to himself and wants us to know him. Our God is a seeking, drawing, yearning God for us to know Him and for us to live alongside Him. Live on the North Shore or planning to visit? Join us here at First Baptist Church Covington for one of our three weekend services. Come be encouraged by Dr. Bailey every Saturday evening at 6 or Sunday mornings at 9.30 or 11 a.m. For more information and directions to our church, visit fbccov.org. First Baptist Church Covington. Experience life-changing relationships. Be sure to tune in again next week for Foundation for Life.